everyone. It's Jamie from Great Lakes Water Safety. Welcome to virtual water safety jam session number three. Nice to see more and more people joining us for these sessions. Our topic this week is one many of you have been asking about what might be the impact of high water levels and beach erosion on water safety. For the past few years, you know, with the uh, we believe that the, the warmer air temperatures were drawing more people to the beaches and warmer water temperatures were drawing them from the beaches into the water. And high water levels were bringing more wave energy closer to the shore where the people are, creating dangerous waves and currents. And that made sense when drownings were rising in, in 2016, 2018, we had a, a record year again. But last year, uh, even though we had record water high levels, record high water levels, drownings were actually down about 17%, according to the stats that our friends at Great Lakes Surf Rescue Project painstakingly track for you. So there's obviously many factors at play here. Um, water levels are certainly one of them. So with us today on our panel are uh, Mark Braderland from Sea Grant, Matt Warner from Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, Jason Wintermute from Ontario, and once again providing color commentary for both countries is our own Dan Metcalf. Welcome everyone. So we realize that our panelists aren't the only ones who know about these topics. So I highly encourage you to use the chat window to add your own perspectives from your experience, your geographical area, your community, and so on, even if you disagree with what you're hearing. As a community of water safety best practice, the more insights we can glean from one another, the better we will all be in serving the residents and visitors to the Great Lakes area. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, um, the Great Lakes Water Safety Consortium is a community of best practice with more than 700 members learning and freely sharing what they know to help people safely enjoy the waters of the Great Lakes area. Yeah, in support of our many water safety goals and drowning prevention initiatives each year, as a nonprofit, we rely on the generosity of donors and sponsors. Uh, new this week is another Sea Grant, the w University of Wisconsin Sea Grant. Uh, thank you for joining us and sponsoring us, along with uh, Michigan, Illinois, and Indiana Sea Grants. They've been our top supporters over the years, uh, as well as FASTAR in Cleveland, which runs an amazing operation down there, keeping people safe, and the Wall Street Beach in Indiana have been fantastic partners for us. So with that, I will turn it over to our first water safety rock star panelist for today's jam, Matt Warner. Uh, remember to enter your questions in the Q&A and the comments in the chat as you listen. Matt, you ready to go? Sure, let's do it. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jamie, and, and all for joining us. So um, I'm Matt Warner. I'm a coastal hazard specialist with Michigan's uh, Coastal Management Program. I've been working on erosion, flooding, beach safety, and other coastal hazards issues for about 20 years now. Um, and today, as Jamie mentioned, I just want to provide some food for thought on uh, how water levels, high water levels, might be related to uh, beach safety and, and what we want to do uh, moving, moving forward. Um, next slide, please. So when we look at um, when we think about this, are, are high water years more dangerous? Uh, do we see more rescues, fatalities, and incidents at the beaches? Well, the chart on the right really shows uh, the water level record uh, through time. U.S. Corps of Engineers has been tracking these levels since 1918. Um, and similarly, but for a much shorter period of time, um, as Jamie mentioned, the Great Lakes Surf Rescue Project, the National Weather Service, and the consortium have been working to track um, drownings and, and incidents. Um, but we've only been collecting this data in earnest since 2002. Um, so really the story's not yet been fully told in terms of how um, beach safety relates to high water incidents. Um, next slide, please. And if we, so if we dive in and take a little closer look at uh, recent high water compared to beach safety incidents, and I've roughly aligned the two charts you're looking at. So the chart on the top um, shows the number of current related incidents by year in the Great Lakes from 2002 to 2018. And we see a few spikes there. The uh, water level information for Lakes Michigan and Huron is shown on the bottom, again, roughly aligned. 
So if you look at the more recent times, since about 2013, when water levels really started rising, um, you know, you might start to say you can see some trends. We see a little spike in the, the rescues that have occurred. Uh, but again, that the overlapping data record is so limited that we don't have a good long-term record of what we're likely to see um, during these, these high water periods. So let's, uh, let's make sure we keep tracking this data. Um, looking at some of the impacts from high water. So much of the press covers the impacts to infrastructure, right? And high water levels have certainly taken a great toll across our Great Lakes coastline. Um, this slide shows just a few Michigan examples. Damages that include, you know, damage to, to houses. Um, we see a house threatened on the bottom. Um, our public access infrastructures, such as the dock on the upper left, in near Alpena, Michigan, are being inundated. Roadways are being impacted. Just a, a whole realm of, of impacts and, and damages. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> With infrastructure impacts, the shore type certainly matters. And this, again, is true with beach safety. So we're going to see different beach safety impacts and challenges depending on the shore type. And even along some of our high rocky bluffs, we can have beach safety issues, such as we had back in uh, 2017, up in Marquette, Michigan, along Lake Superior, where two people at the area known as Black Rocks were washed off these rock bluffs that are 15 to 20 feet above water level. We had 28 foot waves come through and unfortunately some folks walking on the rocks were, were washed off. So this is all to say that Type of coast matters, um, both in infrastructure impacts and, and beach safety. So put some thought to the type of beach that you like to visit and what challenges you might see. Next slide. We have a diverse Great Lakes shore type. Um, and I apologize to our Canadian friends that I didn't readily have um, data available for the Canadian coast, um, but it's, it's equally diverse. Um, so when you're looking at this map, if you look at the green areas represent our low-lying or wetland shore types, brown areas are generally the, uh, the glacial bluffs and the high, high bluffs, and the yellow, the yellow areas are our dune types. And so in the slides to come, I hope to get you to kind of think about the type of coast that you tend to visit and really start to make some connections about how the type of coast that you visit will be potentially affected by higher water levels and changes in the coast and the beach. Next slide. Our coast is certainly changing. Um, so here again is a, a Michigan example in, in my backyard, if you will. Just looking at our long-term coastal rates of recession, we have areas up in Grand Marais, Michigan, um, central Lake Superior region in the Upper Peninsula with long-term recession rates more than 17 feet per year, okay? We know that these rates are even higher in the more recent high water period um, around the state. Um, but the point here is that our coast is a changing. And as you'll see, and as I think you see along your beach, this all plays in um, to uh, beach safety challenges. Next slide. <clears throat> So let's take a, a look at uh, an example of some uh, vanishing sandy beaches along sort of dune environments. Here's an air photo set from Hoffmaster State Park. So this is in uh, beautiful Muskegon, Michigan, um, kind of uh, central, central eastern Lake Michigan lakeshore. You're seeing a 2014 image of this beach on the left hand side of your screen and a 2019 image on the right-hand side of your screen. The blue line for reference is a shoreline that I digitized using a GPS unit in August of 2013. So I'm sure it just jumps right out at you, the amount of recreational beach that has been lost in just a, a five-year period is immense. So this clearly has significant implications on folks who visit this beach especially in a time when we're, we're needing to social distance 
and they're going to have you know large capacity, large volume of people visit this beach and try to try to recreate safely. The other item I'll have you note on this this slide is just the vast amount of sediment that you can see submerged on the photo on the right in the 2019 image. There's a vast amount of sediment in the near shore, highly mobile sand that's creating uh, that, that bar and, and near shore system. Next slide, please. I wanna to touch on a, a few additional um, hazards to watch for when you're at the beach during these high water periods. On the left-hand side, we see one of our, our Michigan beaches on the southeast Lake Michigan coastline, an area where we have structures, a groin field along the shoreline. And as you can see, and as I'm sure you see at a lot of the beaches everyone visits, um, there's a very narrow beach in this area. Um, we know that, that seawalls and structures like this cause deeper lake bed at, at the structure. So as wave energy hits that structure, some of the energy is going to be deflected downward. It's going to scour that lake bed, making potentially dangerous scour pits right along that seawall sea and structure. Um, so just please be sure to, to keep this in mind and use extreme caution if you're trying to walk along the beach um, along any sort of structure, whether or not it's, it's a short parallel seawall or revetment or sort of a combination as you see in this picture with a, a seawall and a, a groin field. On the right hand side, we have another Southeast Lake Michigan beach. Um, this is uh, Tuscornia Beach near St. Joseph, Michigan. Very dune like it is a dune environment, large four dunes and as you see here, um, more recent erosion has created erosion scarps. These scarps are on the order of about eight to 10 feet tall. And so when visitors are approaching the scarp from the landward side, they may not see the steep drop off immediately. So this can, can really present a, a fall hazard to, uh, to beach visitors. So again, just a couple of uh, hazards to, to keep in mind and to watch for that, that really uh, are, are exacerbated by high water conditions. Next slide, please. So I mentioned shore type is, is key. If we look at our, our high bluff shore types, um, I wanted to show an, an example of this and, and how high water represents itself um, along our, our glacial bluff shorelines. This is Orchard Beach State Park um, along uh, kind of the central Lake Michigan coast. And the photo on the left shows Orchard Beach in 2004. So during the low water period, uh, fairly wide, uh, decent recreational beach. Um, the 2018 photo on the right shows the beach has been eliminated. The beach is, is just gone. Um, there is a structure there. And um, let's see, we can, if you'll move to the next slide, Jamie, we can see this from a little different vantage point. So again, uh, time lapse. Low water on the left, again, Orchard Beach State Park. Uh, decent amount of beach, at least recreational and, and swimmable. There's a gabion structure to the, the right of that photo. And then uh, in the more recent photo with high water, we see there's almost no um, recreational or, or what we refer to as a, a subaerial beach. Um, this, in fact, at Orchard Beach State Park, our Michigan DNR has closed the designated swim area at this location because there's simply um, not enough um, gradual slope. Conditions get too dangerous too quickly as you move offshore. It's, it's quite a steep shoreline. And especially, I, as you can imagine, if we get a significant wave flow into this site, we have all kinds of reflection um, off that structure. And, and challenges for, for beach goers. So I think you can see the um, <clears throat> difference there between a, a sandy beach and a, a bluff environment. So erosion is necessary for beaches to sustain. So this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think you'll, you'll find it important and there's a, a definite connection. Coastal erosion is, is really only a problem when we build structures or houses or infrastructure in its path. In fact, from a beach standpoint, we need beaches to erode if we are to sustain the sand supply um, for those beaches to remain in place. And so <clears throat> um, what we found is that 
as more and more seawalls and revetments are being built, we're losing the overall sand supply to our recreational beaches. So that's something that we as a, a community who um, want to enjoy our beaches just need to keep in mind and, and, uh, and work uh, towards uh, sustaining our, our recreational beaches. Next slide, please. So where does the sand go along those beaches where erosion is occurring? Well, in a simple form, it moves into the offshore, right, or into the near shore. So the sediment's eroded, and we have what's called a summer beach profile and a winter beach profile, which you can see in the, the bottom right of your, your screen. And really, at its essence, the sand that's eroded from the beach moves into the nearshore bar system, at least as a first flush, and then depending on sediment size, it, it might move around. But the big point I want to get across here in terms of beach safety is that right now, with all the beach erosion ongoing, there is just a ton of newly deposited sand and sediment in the near shore, and this sediment is highly mobile. Okay, so we know the importance of sandbars for rip current formation, and just know that the sandbar systems are highly mobile, and there's a ton of newly deposited sand in that system. Next slide, please. So this slide really just reinforces that. Sandbars are a true key, especially when we're talking about traditional rip currents. Um, as you know, rip currents, um, the waves, the waves um, crash over the sandbar system, the water piles up behind the sandbar, and then in a traditional rip current, it looks to break through those sandbar systems. So again, as I mentioned, we have a lot of sediment in the sandbars, highly mobile bars um, moving around, so really conditions are, are prime for, uh, for a lot of traditional rips during high water um, periods when beaches are, are actively eroding. Next slide, please. It all comes back to this, right, the, the wheel. So I just wanted to stress, know before you go. And with what I've just provided you in terms of sandbar information, one thing I, I hope folks will think about is what does the beach look like that I'm planning to head to? Okay, what's the beach type? Are there sandbars? What's, what's the beach area going to be? So on and so forth. Next slide. We have some great tools available that can help us know before you go in terms of coast type and, and near shore sediments and, and things like that. And you don't need to be a geologist to do some basic interpretation of these features. This is an example. This slide shows just a, a screen capture from Google Earth, uh, beautiful La Train, Michigan. And again, the, the um, rip current channels are just so, um, they stand out so well at this site. You can see the crescentic bars, um, the kind of darker areas show the rip current channels. This is a photo from June 2011, readily available in Google Earth. In that tool, if you click on the time bar in the top left corner, you can actually scroll through different um, time series photos right within Google Earth. So you have the opportunity to see how the beach changes over time, whether or not these sandbars persist, whether or not um, <coughs> rip current channels persist through time. So you can really get a good sense of those sort of beach characteristics also see what kind of parking is available at the beach, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Of course, National Weather Service provides us with a, a wonderful resource in the Great Lakes Beach Hazards uh, website. And I must admit, it took me several months of using this tool before I realized just how robust it was. And I just wanna point out that it, folks may, may have used this page but not to its full extent. In the right-hand corner of the, the National uh, Weather Service tool, there's a pop-up that allows you to look at forecast data. And by just clicking a, a few check boxes there, you can see wave conditions um, as they are currently 12, 12 hours ahead and a whole host of other forecast and observed uh, data resources that are just uh, amazingly valuable, again, 
the idea to be knowing before before you go, before you make that investment to uh, head out to the beach. Next slide, please. NOAA provides us with another tool that allows us to, uh, to look at the beach and, and understand it a bit better. This is the Great Lakes Lake Level Viewer, now available for uh, the entire US side of, uh, of the Great Lakes Coast. Again, I apologize uh, to our, our Canadian partners. Hopefully you have something similar that I'm, I'm not aware of. But this tool allows you to look at lake levels and um, sort, of, uh, sort of run through scenarios to see what the lake level looks like anywhere from six feet below the long-term average lake level to six feet above the long-term average lake level. So you can, uh, you see the sort of slider dialogue on the left-hand side of the screen, and you can click on that and raise or lower lake levels and really get a, a sense to see how the, uh, the lake, the recreational beach area might expand or contract with these uh, various lake levels. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, this is probably more of a, a teaser, hopefully. Um, this is just one example of a, a statewide tool. Um, and so, you know, make sure you're, you're aware of any state, statewide or regional tools that may be available related to beach safety um, in your area. This is a project that uh, Michigan Tech, Dr. Guy Meadows and, and uh, Amanda Grimm up at Michigan Tech worked on under a Michigan Coastal Management grant. And it actually is a hotspot mapping of Great Lakes rip currents uh, along the Michigan coast. So they use time-lapse uh, photography um, to really assess where our most problematic and most challenging areas are. A wonderful resource. And again, I mentioned it's a teaser because my understanding is that uh, Dr. Meadows will be presenting at a future water safety jam. So I'm hoping that uh, more details and information will be shared uh, about this tool uh, during that uh, session. Next slide, please. There's a, a lot of great information being put out by local units of government as well. This is an example from the uh, city of Holland in Michigan, and they have a, a really nicely done website, uh, Red Flag Water Safety, including a, a video, some short videos, and uh, the left-hand side there, there's a, a beach cam. Again, these webcams that can be extremely val valuable um, to know before you go. And I uh, just recently learned that this is actually a scientific web webcam um, that NOAA has put out to uh, really monitor and uh, in real time track um, near shore currents and, and dangerous currents um, there at, at Holland State Park. So. Uh, Stay tuned for more information about the, uh, the NOAA research. It's great to have that sort of research and presence occurring in our, our Great Lakes Basin. Next slide, please. And of course, I'm, I'm hearing word uh, even today that you know with the gale force conditions that are occurring along our lakeshore today, my understanding is that at least the South Haven Pier is, is uh, actively being washed over. I'm sure that's the case with many of our, our piers right now. Um, bottom line is, it's not a good year to, to take a stroll out on the pier uh, with high water levels and uh, some of the challenges on these structures and adjacent to these structures, it's, it's best to avoid these structures um, at these high water conditions. Um, so I've gone through that uh, fairly quickly. I hope that provides some food for thought. And, uh, you know, I welcome any, any questions or dialogue in, in the chat. Uh, thank you for, uh, for listening. Thank you, Matt. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, you pulled together some amazing photos and data. Thank you for sharing all that and uh, distilling it down for us. Um, please keep posting comments in the chat, questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll get to those after our other presenters. Um, again, great insights. So now I'd like to turn it over to Mark Breederland. Uh, he's been to several areas already this year that have been hard hit by high water levels. Um, and we look forward to his insights as well, Mark. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks everybody for uh, joining us and uh, for your time and uh, it's a pretty uh, serious situation out there the, this year and uh, appreciate everybody um, 
uh, being willing to go. So Jamie's finding the slides and uh, you can go right to the next uh, next slide. Just said a wild ride here in 2020. And I think for many of us, it's already been a wild ride in 2019. And uh, this is a long uh, duration event. And um, um, I just wanted to show, uh, I'll just start real quick with uh, taking folks back seven to eight years. And this happens to be in, in uh, West Grand Traverse Bay. And uh, just the difference in uh, the shoreline. If you were able to stand out there kind of at the edge of the dock or whatever and somehow you could stand there for eight years you would be uh it would be six feet higher so you'd pretty much be fully underwater um next slide please in a in a short period of time so i just wanted to remind people that um we have it was um michigan and huron uh came very close to breaking some records we have this 101 year uh period of record and uh, it didn't in 2019 officially break any records. It came within an inch. But here in 2020, every month has been breaking the record. So we have 101 Januaries and 2020s is the highest by in the neighborhood of four inches. And then February's broke the record. So each of those arrows show the actual, um, the red line shows the uh, actual recording. And then we have the uh, forecast by the Corps of Engineers and there's a green line. Again, um, we are breaking, we broke the May record, the April record. Uh, we're gonna break the June record, the July record, the August record, and maybe even the September record. So this, uh, actually this is the May, May forecast, the June forecast is now out, but the main message is we've never seen it um, or even people before us uh, in, in uh, maybe a generation or so seen it ever this high. So beaches are different. So um, next slide, please. Again, that variation in a 101 foot, 101 year record is actually six feet, four inches. So um, in October, 1986, we had the highest monthly average, those 30 day averages, and that was 582.35. And the most probable forecast shows uh, the July uh, 2020 uh, record at uh, a tenth of a foot, which is just over an inch in the U.S. system uh, away from tying that record. So um, maybe there's a few of you that remember the 1986. There was just tremendous rain in the September and, and whatnot. But um, we have this variation. And again, we just look back in January 2013 as the monthly low, and that was 576.02 on the, on the U.S. scale there. So, so again, huge uh, variation, as we said, and changes in these uh, last seven, eight years, and a uh, long period of record coming up uh, as, we, as we consider it. So next slide, please. So I just want to reiterate again and strengthen all the great slides that Matt Warner has presented to us. You can again use tools like Google Earth and again look at those uh, sandbars. They have they are changing again just to reiterate all the uh, the dynamics of the nearshore coast. So beaches are not like what you remember them when you were a kid or when you went there a few years ago and haven't been back since. So uh, we we want everybody to be safe, enjoy them, but be prepared for them to be a bit different. Next slide, please. So um, the stairs, uh, I had some, one on my screen. These are happen to be in uh, Leelanau County. Again, um, there is debris. We talked about this uh, uh, the other webinar too. Um, but uh, the shoreline is, is really different. These uh, uh, places that you may have had access to in the past, even if uh, first responders and others potentially have to go out to help somebody, you can't just get down the uh, shore like you did uh, a few years ago. Next slide, please. This is in uh, Frankfurt, Michigan. Again, you can just see the height. Uh, that's my daughter there. And uh, again, you know, some of those bluffs are easily uh, six foot. This is right in downtown, in between the uh, the pier. So, um, so lots of lots of changes. Um, they have some areas that are kind of blown out, and you can get access down there. But much of the beach is is uh, quite different. Next slide, please. 
And again, um, places that have been scoured and the, due to the, uh, the wave energy that's hit at such high water levels and bringing down not only those uh, stair steps and the, uh, the screws and the pieces of uh, debris out there, but these large logs. So, so they're both a floating hazard if you're a boater uh, if you're a swimmer out there, you may actually potentially encounter uh, floating debris like this, or it may be up on the shore where it is here at uh, Point Betsy, uh, Michigan. So um, again, uh, really a big heads up besides the, the nearshore dynamics and the rip currents and the, uh, the changes in the, um, in the sandbars that we've already talked about. Next slide. So again, uh, this is my closing slide. Again, just to remind people, We've had uh, incidents and uh, tragic losses and many communities have these uh, peer safety signs dedicated to uh, the people that have been lost on these uh, areas. Again, they're gonna be extra kind of dangerous this year with these high levels. It doesn't take much of a wind to uh, potentially push the water up over the uh, top of the pier. So again, let's, uh, let's enjoy these waters, let's be safe and uh, um, just, uh, um, be, will it be able to come back next year with no, uh, no tragic stories and uh, uh, make it a win-win for everybody. So thanks, Jamie, for allowing us to uh, comment. Of course. Thanks for that presentation, Mark. I know you, you get around, you see a lot of different areas. You have a nice perspective on things. And I definitely recognize quite a few of those locations. If you had quizzed me, I think I would have, I think I would have passed. Um, so now for another perspective from our friends in Ontario, we have Jason Wintermute. Jason, I'll let you introduce yourself and then I'll bring up your slides. Hello, I'm Jason Wintermute. I'm with an agency on the Canadian side called the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority. It's a, an organization based on a watershed. So it's a, a kind of a different geography um, managed by a couple municipalities put together. Um, I'm gonna start talking about just what we see in one of our municipalities, Chatham-Kent, and I'm talking about Chatham-Kent because it's a pretty big municipality and has various different types of shorelines that are, that are all getting impact. So I'm gonna move on. Next slide. Um, so, you know, as Matt showed, there's different types of shorelines and different impacts. Um, the first one I was gonna talk about is these high bluffs that, that are here. Um, these are extremely high bluffs on sediment. Um, not rock bluffs. And this stretch here is one that, uh, slump that occurred in March. Bluff is probably about 80 feet high here. And basically this just happened overnight. What you're looking at here in these, these two slides on the left. Um, this is a municipal works yard. Um, they came back, they went at four o'clock, they went home, they came back the next morning and this is what they saw behind them. Um, massive slump um, and so there's enormous safety issues around this of, of you know what's at the top of this bluff is clearly unsafe if this can happen overnight what about anything you have at the base of this bluff um, you know extremely challenging now fortunately we haven't had any structures fall failure to this but my picture on the right is a little cottage that, uh, that did suffer from something like this back in the late 2000s. And if you look in close, you can actually see the front half of the, the cottage tore away from the, from the back end because it, the front end was hanging over the edge of the bluff that failed. Um, you know, so can happen very quite quickly. Another area that um, Chanukin has is these shoreline cottages and and they used to all have a beach in front of them, which is now gone. Um, but, you know, there's still an expectation that at some point they'll come back. And I think I wanted to point out two things on these pictures. You know, one is this wave. And if you look on the left, it's just a giant wave. And so the water comes in, the wave comes in, it hits these vertical shore walls that people have put in to protect their cottages. The wave sprays up. Um, kind of like, you know, the previous pictures about the pier, you know, these waves can go 30 feet high. And then because it's an onshore wind, that wave actually slams into the back of the, of the cottage. And you can see the results, kind of the thing on the, 
on the two photos on the on the left, kind of the resulting damage to the cottages. But another comment I wanted to make about, you know, thinking, oh, sorry if you can go back, about the future of, of these beaches when they come back. Everybody expects the beach is going to be come back, but the people have gotten desperate and they've been trying to put rock and stuff in the, in the water. And one of the things they like to do, because it's really cheap, is they'll put broken up concrete in there. Sometimes they've left rebar in it and things like that. And this presents two, do, two different hazards. One is that the concrete will break up and then the waves will throw chunks of concrete at these houses. And you can kind of see in the middle picture all this like small rock rubble. And then the other thing is the rebar now contaminated the beach. So once they come back, um, you know, once the beach comes back, there's a question as whether they can even really use their beach now because it, it's filled with uh, hazardous debris. So, so next slide. And the last one I wanted to talk about is, is Wheatley Provincial Park. Now, I'm not a representative of the provincial government, so I can't speak about their, their plans, you know, for the park. But I wanted to, to talk about this because it brings up a, a, next, uh, a question about access. So the middle figure shows what the park looked like in 2015. Um, then you can see there's a beach all the way along. Um, this is about a mile long stretch here. And in the area that I've circled in the middle is the roadway where it's closest to the beach. And it's about 100 feet from the shore there to the near edge of the road. And then the pictures on the left and right basically show that, well, there's the road and it goes over the precipice. Um, it's kind of that low six foot scarp that people were talking about earlier. Um, but in this case, it's, it's eroded back 100 feet or so. Pro well, probably more because the entire road is now taken out. Um, and so we've lost the beach, the scarp is gone. And, and the other important thing here is access. You know, there was a, an expectation that people could get down to this beach. Um, the beach is there no more, um, but you can't get down there with the road. And if people go down there, um, you know, services can't get to them. This is a massive chunk of land that was for recreational use and, and the one road in and out to it is now gone. If there was an accident, there's no way for emergency services to get down to these people. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a serious problem for, for anybody thinking to use this beach. Um, so that's it, I just wanted a couple slides. The previous presenter did a great job of, of pointing out, um, you know, these kinds of hazards and I just thought, uh, Point some examples of the of the really challenging stuff we're dealing with too in Ontario. That's it. That's great, Jason. Thank you for that perspective. That's some some really amazing images there. It's incredible all the all the changes happening everywhere and clearly affecting safety. Uh, why don't we go now to uh, Dan Metcalf? See if he has anything he'd like to add from his perspective. Hello, everyone. Uh, no, I think uh, not too much to add. I, I want to thank all the presenters. It's a fantastic job and, and coming on board. And I think we all have to take a lot of caution if we're heading to the beach, uh, uh, both uh, on both international sides and the Great Lakes, as boaters, as swimmers. Um, the shoreline has changed. The water, um, uh, the sands and the waters have changed. Um, and then the COVID, throw in the COVID and, and our beaches aren't open in Ontario and also our waters aren't open due to the border closure. So I just wanted to mention that, but uh, just be safe out there. Uh, if the waves are high, don't be in the water and uh, check the conditions before you head out and wear your life jacket like Mark has on <laughs> if you're on the water. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Dan. So Mark, have you been taking a uh, look at the Q and A in the chat to see what uh, questions people might have or comments. Yeah, there was a, a few comments just about uh, some of the um, uh, areas where and swimmer size and whatnot. So Matt, did you want to comment that you had already kind of taken a stab at answering that, but maybe you could verbalize that. About the so there was a question about the uh, wave height. Um, I don't know if that's the one you're referring to, Mark, but yeah, the question was about uh, wave height and what wave heights do uh, rip currents typically start to be an issue. And really, in, in large respect, that refers to the individual's ability to some extent, certainly. So 
So, you know, is it an adult person or is it a, a kid or, or toddler that makes a huge difference? And then what swimming ability does that individual have? Beyond that, when we look at the data, we see that really waves as little as about two feet in height are where we start to see the, the incidents, the rip current incidents, rescues and fatalities um, really begin. At least that's what the data seems to bear out. Thanks, Matt. That's a great, great answer to that. I haven't seen a lot of other questions. Um, somebody asked if there would be a shareable link with uh, to share over in Ontario with other conservation authorities. Those are important uh, parts of government over there in Ontario. So um, I think we can uh, have some of the information. Jamie, you want to comment on that? Yeah, we'll be following up on each of these jam sessions with uh, a post to our YouTube channel with the recordings for people who weren't able to make it live today. And we can include links in the in the comments there, um, as well as in our e-newsletter, The Wave, and our messages from, from me and other panelists. So we'll definitely get some, some links and uh, other materials back out to everyone um, before the series is over. Uh, I was going to comment uh, real quick, Jamie, that, uh, you know, while Michigan, Huron, and Superior are still kind of going through their seasonal rise, um, it looks like uh, Erie and Ontario have already peaked and are gradually settling down. So we'll see if that trend continues. It depends on if we get more of these storm systems, almost like this uh, one where this crystal ball that is happening today, it's a pretty impactful system, especially on Lake Michigan, it appears. So, um, but uh, it looks like uh, Erie and Ontario have already peaked. See another I'll question spec, I'll, spec in. In, I'll spec in that one too for, or on Mark's uh, comment. Um, but yeah, the wind setup uh, definitely affects uh, uh, St. Clair, Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie being fairly shallow. So uh, we see that every time we get a storm come through. So it's important to watch that weather uh, whether you're walking along the beach or a uh, shoreline area or whether in a boat or, or even if you're attempting to swim around a watercraft. Mark, was there another question? A uh, question just came in if, asking if anybody has uh, time-lapse videos taken on beach erosion that's happening at some of our Great Lakes beaches or are there any communities that are doing that? So Matt Warner, do you know, you mentioned the Holland one in your presentation, but I'm not sure it's set up for time lapse per se? Yeah, so I think different folks are, are doing different efforts. I know in Michigan, in our example, um, our hazard uh, emergency response is operated out of the Michigan State Police, and they've actually been working to capture some video um, footage of, of the shoreline in certain areas that have been impacted. Um, so they're tracking it that way. I know other folks, you know, there's been a lot of drone work um, I, there is certainly a need for um, more photo collection, um, both oblique imagery and, and vertical photography moving forward um, so that we can really track and better understand how our beaches are, are, have changed during this, this high water period. So that's, uh, that's certainly a need. So I don't know if anyone else on the panel or, or otherwise has experience in, in their region. I was just going to make a, a quick comment uh, for our local area. I know uh, a lot of our emergency managers are starting to uh, uh, implement drone technologies and taking a look at our coastlines, our berms, our dikes, those kinds of things, besides taking uh, pictures from shorelines. So I think it's an ongoing uh, uh, enterprise, especially with these last few years. And our conservation authorities are a huge part of that as well. Uh, I'm just going to read a question that Todd wrote. I was wondering if any of the state parks or, or other parks, you know, would actually kind of comb through popular areas looking for uh, debris like screws. That would be, you know, again, we've kind of stressed this, uh, be a good year for sure for water shoes, but, you know, nails and other things that could penetrate. So um, I don't know, Matt, if you know of any, but I do remember uh, just a few years ago, there was a uh, uh, kind of a loss of a, a wooden vessel, a boat that washed up at Ludington State Park, and they definitely had to go out there and collect it, but they weren't in the midst of kind of the high water crisis, and it was kind of a focused area. So now we have 
just miles and miles of debris and, and, and probably even more limited, um, you know, capacities of some of our state and, and other parks. So um, I'm not sure on that. So Matt, I don't know if you have any other thoughts or comments from the DNR side, even though you're an eagle. Yeah, so our, our sister agency, our Michigan Department of Natural Resources, operates the, the state parks, and they have designated swim areas. So that's really part of the effort to, to funnel the swimming activities to these designated swim beaches. And in doing so, they, they make it more manageable so they can maintain, and certainly the, the park supervisors are out there, and you know they, they do their best to maintain those and, and make those areas as safe as possible it certainly becomes more challenging when you look at the state park system as a whole and you go outside of these designated swim areas. So really the best advice I think um, in most cases is if you're going to swim and go in the water, try to find those designated swimming areas because more than likely those are the areas that the management agencies are, are actively working to, to keep them as, as safe as possible. What else, Mark? Jamie, there was just one more that related to erosion and, and again, where uh, families maybe have swam for generations near a family cottage or whatnot. And again, just being extra concerned about the potential of the rebar, the concrete uh, pieces as Jason had mentioned. So um, I, I don't know if there's any other comments on that, but definitely it'd be, uh, it'd be worthwhile. Always wear some good water shoes and um, uh, maybe look for a uh, possibly a, a pathway that you know you can enter and exit um, where there's not going to be any of that stuff and not try to enter in another place that's a little bit more unknown. So I don't know, Jason or others, if you have any thoughts on that. I think it's a great point, Mark, uh, Stan. I think uh, when we have also these flood conditions with the high water levels, we get a heavy downpour and coming down our major rivers on our side, the Thames, the Detroit, um, you know, uh, Cedar Creek, uh, those kind of tributaries brings down a lot of dead heads, um, waste, uh, uh, things that are going to be floating in the water and then hit the shorelines. And that can change overnight and change the beach before you head to it. So it's always a good idea once you get down to the beach, take a good look and, and, and make sure you've got water shoes on and, uh, you know, keep an eye out for those kinds of pieces of debris that you guys have mentioned. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's really difficult to be keeping on top of this. Uh, with the high water levels and the energy and the waves, they can move around a tremendous amount of sand. You know, people have reported, you know, oh, a storm came in last night and, and all of a sudden I've got four feet of beach. And then, you know, the next event comes and it's all gone for them. So it's really difficult to, to keep on top of any particular beaches. And, you know, the comment about people may think, oh, I remember my beach being that way. It's just changing so fast. It's really difficult to keep on top of, of what's there on the beach. That's great. Um... I'm going to jump in here while people are thinking of their last questions and comments uh, before we wrap up. I want to share a fun thing. The last time we talked about our new uh, water safety brochures, which are now at the printer, uh, but something else we just reprinted are our, our bumper stickers, our member stickers. I've loved bumper stickers since before I had a bumper. And um, I remember having quite a collection on my bike as a kid, and now my old Subaru is pretty much covered with them. So we've got a bunch of these brochures, um, and we're going to have a bunch of these stickers, and we're going to make those available to you as well. Uh, so you can wear those proudly as a member of the water safety community. Um, and if you order one of our universal beach warning signs for your beach or park, um, we'll send the sticker along with that, along with brochures. Um, these, uh, we've had hundreds of them already distributed. They were tested. Matt Warner was very involved in this, as a matter of fact, uh, testing them in, in uh, state parks. And then we've uh, updated them with the branding and we added a QR code that takes you right to that Great Lakes uh, Beach Warning um, website from the National Weather Service that Matt showed. So you can zoom in, see what's happening at your beach, what warnings and forecasts there are, 
and what the conditions are to help keep you safer. So we've got six of these signs. They're really high quality um, and they're popping up all around the Great Lakes. So if you, if you have older signs, if you don't have warning signs, please visit our website, greatlakeswatersafety.org and order uh, one or more of those signs to help keep your, your visitors safe. Um, so with that, I was gonna let Mark come back and see if there's any more comments or questions to share. Jamie, there's just a few, uh, you know, some of the very popular beaches have beach grooming machines and obviously uh, the people are doing the best they can to uh, remove debris after each storm event or wind event. Um, there was a question on uh, a speculation on when people think uh, Ontario beaches might uh, um, open. And again, uh, just a comment on the shifting sandbars and debris are definitely hazards for nearshore watercraft also. Um, think of jet skis and others. And again, we're all about trying to uh, uh, be safe in all forms of watercraft and uh, really provide safety for the first responders. So uh, nearshore stuff is gonna be a really uh, kind of high hazard area in 2020, as we can see from all these record highs. So. Uh, those were the comments and questions that came in. I don't know if anybody wanted to respond to any of those, um, but that was it. I think I can comment on the Ontario uh, beaches, Mark. Uh, I think that's going to be a process of measured opening and based on the Ontario government's uh, COVID-19 uh, plan. Um, it's just going to be very measured and I, I'd hate to even predict when that may occur. So uh, we still have an emergency declared probably to the end of June. Um, so it's going to be a slow process, I think, across Ontario, and it's going to depend what region um, the beach is in and uh, how the government's label the COVID-19 situation in each region. Yeah, I can add to what we just said there. There, were, there was something that came out just two days ago about the different phases, and we are moving into a phase for some of our regions where they may be able to reopen the beaches but they're leaving the final decision up to the local health unit. Um, so there are some beaches that may be able to be opened in the next few weeks, but it's gonna depend on, on the local agencies about whether they feel comfortable with, with their beaches and opening them, so. Any other comments from Mark or Matt? Um, none from my end, thanks, Jamie. None from me. All right, Matt shared earlier the water safety wheel. We promised that we'd share water safety fundamental uh, messages and so on in each of these sessions. And he covered that a little bit in that wheel, but things like know before you go, stay dry when waves are high, when in doubt, don't go out and steer clear of the pier, always wear a life jacket, don't just bring it, things like that. So I will wrap with a plug for our next session, translating wave and current science into reducing swimming risk. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Guy Meadows from the Great Lakes Research Center and uh, up at Michigan Tech, and we'll also have a uh, senior forecaster from the National Weather Service, Bob Dukscherer, and they're going to talk about all of that next Wednesday, same time, same place. And then we've got a few more good ones after that. Um, I also want to, again, thank our generous sponsors. Um, really can't do this without you. And all the, all the money that we get from donations and sponsorships uh, goes right back into water safety. We have virtually no overhead costs. We're all volunteers. So uh, please keep supporting us in our many initiatives. Uh, thanks to our many planners on the team for both the unconference that we had to postpone and these, this new series of uh, virtual jam sessions. And thank all of you. Uh, join us next week. Help spread the word so we get more and more people hearing these important messages. Contact me if you'd like to step up and serve on one of, or more of our action committees. Ask for um, sponsorship and donations and follow us on social media. Um, that's it. And uh, thanks again for all your participation. Thanks to our panelists one more time. Big round of applause in the chat. Let's hear it. Um, great job. Fantastic information. And uh, we look forward to next week's session with even more. So thanks again, everybody stay safe and take care.